Good morning, everybody. Um, so thank you, Carl Gustav. Um, yes, to um, thank you, the uh, organizers for the opportunity to come here and talk about the uh, distribution of plastics, especially microplastics, in the, in the oceans, which, of course, is a quite big task to try to uh, address and, and trying to do it in half an hour or so. But I'll certainly do my best to try and uh, choose to take first of a bit of a global outlook and then narrow down more to, towards the Baltic and the, the uh, other regional seas around Sweden. Um, first of all, I thought we let's go on a journey and let's go to Henderson Island. How many know about Henderson Island? Only a few. So great. Let's let's um, take off then. And if we were about here, and we'll see if we can make a very quick passage. And here we go to Henderson Island in the middle of the South Pacific. Closest uh, island is uh, Pitcairn Island. And it's uh, thousands of kilometers from the nearest continents. And uh, it's home to a number of endemic uh, species, especially seabirds. And um, I had a friend that was sailing there some 10, 15 years ago and took these pictures. And um, that's right where it is. And at first, you see this, um, it looks pretty much like a tropical paradise, I think. Uh, but when he stepped down onto these shores, it looks like this. So a huge amount of, of marine litter, especially most of it plastic, as you can see. It's later been uh, surveyed uh, and published uh, a paper which claimed to be the most polluted place uh, in the world when it comes to marine litter. And he also pointed the camera towards the sand, and as you can see also, small pieces of plastic, fragments, what we call microplastics, and the one big reason why we're here today. And um, it's been well documented that uh, marine organisms, uh, especially seabirds, that is foraging uh, their food on the surface in, in these waters are suffering, both on the individual and population level. And we'll um, um, hear much more about that from Bethany later on. Um, Following that, about the same time, I would say, there was a number of uh, environmentalists, I call them, uh, people of, that were concerned about um, the uh, high abundance of marine um, plastics in the North uh, Pacific gyre, the, the um, uh, high latitude belts, where there are uh, quite rarely any, any boats going. But uh, Charles Moore here was one of the first sailors that, that uh, observed and uh, got concerned about this issue and organized several uh, expeditions uh, with uh, um, tools from zooplankton studies. There was nets and um, called manta trolls, about 0.3 millimeters in, in mesh size. And they took uh, citizen science approaches, but they actually published several uh, peer review papers that have been uh, quite uh, important to, to get the first data in place. And also was um, um, very effective in advocacy and awareness increasing. Um, and there was narratives that thought, started to spread about this uh, great Pacific garbage patch. I'm sure you, you, you picked up on some of these earlier. Um, flows so, uh, through social media and so on. That, that spurred quite large research interest, and, and that's why we're here today as well. Uh, I was saying this is our uh, legacy. But there also the narratives that Carl Gustav mentioned, that of the garbage continent, that, that was also the foundation that these initiatives so as uh, ocean uh, cleaning campaigns um, came to place, I think. Um, so if we then uh, 
take a stand here and ask ourselves a few fundamental questions. So, first of all, why is this ac accumulation uh, taking place in the, in the first place? Um, and uh, where does the plastic come from? Geographical origin, we think it's certainly not uh, from Henderson Island. What are the sources, uh, land-based or, or marine? And what kind of objects uh, are the most common ones? Then, how much, of course, big, big issue, and uh, what happens to it once in, in the sea? Um, yes, it fragments, but why and to what extent, and then what? So, finally, where does it end up? Um, we have all the ecological and social consequences. I will touch upon a few of these aspects, but other speakers will follow and, and address uh, some of the others, I'm sure. Um, if we first ask ourselves why is such an accumulation taking place in the middle of the, of the high seas in these uh, um, subtropical gyres, it's a great uh, high, high pressure uh, areas, well, uh, which is known that flotsam of all sorts uh, are focused and accumulated by the currents and, and um, dominating wind, wind pressure systems, um, the trade wind belts and the the westerly uh, um, low pressure systems here in the North Atlantic. Um, there's been lots of data gathered by ocean drifters, satellite buoys that is drifting around and, and collecting data for oceanographers to develop models and simulations, such as this by uh, my colleague, Jöran Brostum. And this was a simulation that he did uh, for a report we, we made to the last uh, UN Oceans Conference to ask about what are the consequences for uh, small island development states of the marine litter, for example, here in the Caribbean. So he, he released particles um, color-coded from different regions, so you can see how they spread around, and uh, they are released for two years, and then the release stops. So then you can see how it uh, persists and, and uh, accumulates. So, for example, from the South American coast, you see it goes into the Gulf of Mexico, while the US release goes more out in here. The, the European one is partly going northwards and partly to this uh, gyre system. So after only a few years, uh, the particles that is not stranded will be forming this um, um, area between the Bermuda and Azores and Canary Islands, where we know from measurement that there is a higher um, abundance of, of floating plastics. So then, how, how much was the next question? How much enters the sea is, of course, the most important uh, to us, and where? Um, well, we have quite good statistics, at least when it comes to the global production. Um, the, the latest numbers now are up in the 350 million tons range per year. But, um, but of course, need to think about this is annual production. So, in many senses, the, the, the cum cumulative uh, production is also important. And uh, Jana Janbeck and colleagues did uh, this study where they looked at production, use, and fate of all plastics ever made. So that's taking this uh, cumulative approach. And their estimates uh, of all production that had ever been done, um, looking at the flows in society, estimated roughly 5,000 million tons uh, could have been discarded, meaning putting in landfills or lost into the natural environment. And of course, we need to think, when we start thinking, okay, where does it go? On the sea surface, sediments, beaches, and some of these areas are more of a transient, while others are more of an accumulation area. Some may be cleaned up, like beaches, but others, like the deep sea, is not. So if we then think of another paper that uh, Jan Beck uh, made, that was quite influential, about where does the... Um, um, waste, uh, plastic waste being emitted. What, what are the main uh, polluters when it comes to countries? They took the global plastic production, uh, the level of waste management systems and some other assumptions, and they combined that with the coastal population. That 
the population within 50 kilometers of the coast. And they modeled the potential of each country to, to have uh, plastic waste going into the ocean. And then they, they did this color coding, where I think uh, China is above 5 million tons uh, of, of po potential pollution. So um, this, of course, uh, indicates, um, based on these parameters, large coastal um, population and uh, the undeveloped waste management system, where there are um, big opportunities to make big difference. I will not point any fingers to, to the countries in Southeast Asia here. Think about the waste, the level of, of plastic waste that have been exported to these countries. I think just say that there is large opportunity to, to uh, work with projects to help building up a better waste management system. And there is lots of initiatives going on, which is very... Nice to see as well. Um, so if we then, that was modeling. Now let's look at some, some measurements, some data. Uh, this was the, um, the first uh, paper that uh, Marcus Ericsson of the Five Dyers uh, worked together and Charles Moore, the, the, the two NGOs I mentioned earlier on. They worked with um, scientists from both um, modeling and measurements side in trying to take their, um, their data points, which was quite unique in the sense uh, at the time in 2014. But on the other hand, you see there is not that many data points if we think in the global, global context. These are the different size fraction they, they measured uh, with these trolls and the abundance that was captured in terms of particles per square kilometer. And um, they estimated that possibly about 250,000 tons uh, were um, accounted for on, on the sea surface. So um, compared to the potential of plastic waste entering the sea from Jambek et al, roughly then uh, on the range uh, 10 million tons per year. It was a small number that was found accounted for on the sea surface. Also in this uh, COSAR paper, uh, the Spanish expedition um, that also did a global survey, took a lot of, of samples, similar uh, methods. They accounted for some tenth, or tenth uh, of thousands of tons only. So. Um, it's, it's again um, pointing out that although there was high accumulation in these subtropical gyres, it's not massive in terms of, of mass. This was later, uh, more recently, um, improved by um, Lebreton et al. This was actually a study funded by the Boyan Slut team of the Ocean Cleanup. With big uh, resources here, they also did an aerial survey there was lots of trolls, both for microplastics and mega, or, or ma macro plastics, larger uh, mesh and sizes, and also this this uh, aerial survey to look at the mega plastics. Think about the big lost fishing gear and and other large um, pieces of, of uh, floating litter, and they actually. Um, uh, um, uh, revised uh, the estimate of the North, North Pacific garbage patch to be uh, four to six times higher than previous estimate in the, in the order of, uh, um, of uh, 45 to 130,000 tons in the North Pacific garbage patch alone. And that's mainly attributed that, that they can statistically capture larger items. And um, if we can see here. Um, so the, the mega plastics and the macro plastics make up most of the mass, while uh, it is the smaller sizes that makes up more of the abundance. Which is natural, but to think about it is, if you want to estimate the mass balance, you need to, to statistically capture the larger items. But maybe from an ecological point of view, the, the smaller sizes are the more uh, relevant. So um, the next step was floating or sinking. We all know polymers come in different densities, and there are these types of, of pedagogic examples are often seen. What, 
what should be sinking and what should be floating. Um, I'll tell you a little bit a story from a, a friend of mine um, and a, a previous retired colleague of Ignacio that we'll talk tomorrow. Uh, on Holmström, that in the early 70s he had a recent PhD in polymer chemistry, and um, some of his uh, neighbors in, in Smögen was fishermen and said that we're getting all these uh, plastic bags in, in the bottom trawls. Uh, you, you're working with plastics, can't, can't you do something about it? And he, he raised the issue at some, some meeting, he told. Um, but it was, uh, it was um, neglected, you could say. You should know better. You have a PhD in polyethylene chemistry. You know polyethylene is not sinking, it's floating, obviously. But he didn't... Um, he was uh, stubborn, per per persevere, and uh, he got some samples and studied the, the biology and the polymer chemistry of, of these plastic bags and could actually then show that it was first uh, oxidized, uh, so the surface was more attractive to biofilms, and it was uh, both uh, lithoderma growth and, and bryozoans, and eventually uh, it would start sinking. And he actually published this in Nature in the 1975. I think it was quite quite good feeling for him. But apparently, uh, unfortunately, this had been a bit of a uh, forgotten topic until more recently, when this plastic issue is up, up on the agenda again. Um, but what, how much uh, micro and macro plastics do we find in sediments? Well, that, there is not. There is, if there is little data on the sea surface, it's much less than sediments. Um, this was the only reference that, that um, um, a study I will show you in, in a second here um, from Enomia was using. It's uh, the FAM paper from 2014, looking at, at uh, trawl data and uh, camera observations from the, from the deep sea sediments about macroplastics. And you see, uh, it's not it's not that much data available. And for, for microplastics in the deep sea, it's, it's much less. So, um, but with, with that little data at hand, and with the data that was available, uh, the Enomia made this um, report to the uh, European Union in 2016. And they had uh, mainly used the, the, the data from the Jambeck uh, paper about the potential of, of input from the, um, from the coastal pollution, land-based, and uh, around 9 million tons globally. And uh, another small contribution from inland sources, the marine sources, uh, about 1.75, so fishing and, and shipping contributing to that. So out of these, about 12 million tons, uh, I would say this is quite rough numbers, of course, very uh, given the assumptions. But approximately this uh, amount was um, estimated to be uh, partitioned uh, or allocated uh, about one percent to the could be accounted for on the sea surface, about uh, five percent on beaches uh, worldwide, and the rest based on this uh, limited data and the mass balances to 94 percent. So I think this, this, the numbers are getting slightly um, better, but it's still um, very little data. Okay, so some is sinking, some is floating. I will now follow the plastics a bit towards our shores. This is another uh, simulation for Jöran Brostum. Uh, we know from, um, from local knowledge on the Swedish West Coast that driftwood, I mean, milk cartoons in the past and nowadays plastics is uh, coming from all the North Sea neighboring countries. And um, this simulation shows also that uh, there is, if you release particles here simulating that things come from the North Sea countries, due to the currents and wind uh, and the geography uh, here, there is lots of capturing on the north northern Bohuslän coastline. And uh, this has also been um, confirmed on, on beach litter uh, surveys um, that is uh, done in this uh, comparable manner from the Gibraltar uh, all, all the way to the North Cape. The Boeslän coastline is the most impacted uh, in the entire region due to these factors. 
And, um, um, but that, that's macroplastics. We did a study on micro litter on the Bosleyan uh, archipelago and close to the urban areas, Gothenburg, Stinnesund and Uddevalla. And if we look at this, uh, one of the exposed sites, um, we can see that among the urban and these uh, outer sites, this is uh, very high. This is a randomized and hotspot sample. So the, 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 uh, this is a hotspot sample. But you see, in both cases, it is Stenungsund and it is this uh, Gås uh, island that is um, much higher than the others. And the, the, um, uh, the nature of the, of the particles is not that different from the Henderson Island. <laughs> Fragments, irregular. Um, but also um, paraffin in the micro form and, and these microspheres that we're quite intrigued about. What, what, what are they and where do they come from? Um, now we'll go a bit more into the measurements and so on, but just want to say a bit, we need to discuss what we are, what are we talking about. Uh, definitions is important. Um, this um, report from uh, Gishamp, uh, that was summarizing the state of the art, um, of sort of consensus uh, of all papers and discussion reports that have been out there. And there is a bit of a discrepancy when we're looking at microplastics, um, especially in the upper limit, if it's five, mi five millimeters or one millimeter. But I think that that's those, those um, different uh, limits will, will uh, remain um, as, as two possible thresholds. And the other one, uh, the lower limit, in some, I think the, the agreed um, ISO definition is more one, one micron is the obvious uh, between micro and nanoplastics, but um, sometimes operational um, limits are, are also used, like the 300 microns or 100 microns or so on, from practical reasons. This paper uh, also was, um, by Hartmann et al, was also reviewing all the, the, the concepts or definitions and came to the suggestion that also the chemical composition um, in the wider context of, of polymers should be included, including things like uh, composites um, that often then um, com um, make up of paint particles, for example, tire wear particles, but also solidity and solubility was uh, proposed as criteria, and then it's discussed different uh, size, shape, and color, and so on as well. Um, it should be mentioned that uh, ISO has uh, that started out from an industrial um, point of view, but also now working on environmental issues, uh, have a slightly different uh, definition. I think uh, Ignacy is in part of that uh, group, so he can maybe follow up more in his talk. But this is quite important to realize. We need also think about standards. Measurements then. If we start with, I call it measurement 1.0, uh, what is state of the art now, what is available and what is feasible right now. Um, of course, we need to sample before we can analyze. Um, the first step has been for a long time visual identification. It is low investment cost, but it's very, very time consuming. And it's to some extent subjective. Um, that is ideally complemented with spectroscopic identification. It could be, uh, for example, FTIR spectroscopy. Um, and um, in order to then um, identify what the unknown uh, spectra is, we need a reference spectra. And that could be often important to, to uh, create reference spectra of environmental plastics. Um, sometimes it's necessary to remove the biofilm, so the organic matter, which is another complicating factor. And hopefully we get some results. The results could be statistically constrained, so we may need to revisit. Uh, so this is kind of the workflow that is possible today, I would say, robust, uh, available even for monitoring, uh, although it's very labor intensive and uh, I think we'll see developments. If we then talk about measurement 2.0, that will be sort of what is a, uh, intensive research um, going on today. Um, 
There, there are more automated and comprehensive analysis schemes. For example, the whole filter FTIR that we see here. The whole filter that is um, in each pixel you have a full spectra and then um, each uh, particle can be allocated if this is the case of this, uh, polyamide or maybe polystyrene. Um, another approach is the particle par particle uh, automatic Raman. As in this case, first all particles are identified and then only doing measurements on the particles, not on the whole filter. And there are the other, other approaches is uh, correlative um, light microscopy or SEM with Raman. That may be necessary if we're going to go for nanoplastics, for example. And there's also a more simple method called uh, near-infrared reflectance spectroscopy. Um, which is quite suitable in monitoring approaches, for, but for a bit larger particles. Um, one needs to think about detection limits, of course, in terms of size and the composition and all of that. Um, and there is lots of focus on automation, because it's not only a uh, time saver, it's also the make it more uh, ob objective results. And I think also machine learning developments um, that we see uh, coming up now to apply this is, is quite interesting. But this is not really today. This is, this is maybe in, in five years' time. Um, so here is one example of the, of the correlative um, microscopy um, that, uh, that we're working with. Uh, we have the SEM and the Raman combination that can be useful. Uh, and we also have the light microscopy. So the same particle can get, be getting different kinds of information. So we now go then to some case studies. Um, the first one I want to mention is a paper we did in Stenungsund, looking at pellets. It's quite big microplastics, around uh, three or four millimeters in size, which actually was done just by, by a um, manual survey on the beaches. Uh, what is quite obvious, the very high abundance around the, the Stenungsund where they have the polyethylene factory and all the handling of the polyethylene. Um, but it also spread in the, in the archipelago and decayed further away. So this was, we looked into also the legal issues and, uh, and, and, and the, um, why this could be uh, happening still, although this was known issue since the 90s. So there's lo lots of nice uh, um, development that has been happening in the last um, one year only since, um, so we'd like to see that we had some influence there at least. Um, in addition to, yes, in addition to the pellets, we also, also uh, lots of smaller particles found in the creek um, entering the bay, and also on the manta trawling in the Stevenson Harbor. You see these uh, particles are assembling this uh, fluffy powder that also is produced in, around the sites. Um, on the beaches in Stenungsund, uh, as well, there was uh, the larger fractions dominated by the pellets, not surprisingly. Um, the smaller sizes was um, uh, uh, half of it was or equal amounts about uh, the fluff um, particles, but uh, almost equal amounts from expanded cellular plastics, which is often spread and found on beaches. Irregular fragments was the other um, component. So in Stenungsund, with uh, also that science of, of the, that industrial spills and handling of plastics, all, all, all um, levels and supply chain is, is important to deal with. We've also worked with sediments in the Stenungsund area for the, the EPA. And um, although the sediment transport is not um, that uh, one needs to think about sediment transport to interpret the results, um, there was um, um, a range of different particles that were found, um, polypropylene and polyethylene, um, that we don't, cannot really say to what extent it may come from industrial production or from the general fragmentation of, of uh, consumer litter. Then there was a, a, a large proportion of PVC that was very irregular in shape and size, which is the other plastic factory in Stenosund. PVC is is a very uh, much heavier uh, density particle as well. Um, so in larger fractions, um, this, the, um, 
semi-transparent fragments was the most common ones, and uh, the polymers that I was identified was mainly PE and PP, uh, some PVC in the larger size fraction, about 300 microns. But in the smaller size fraction, between 100 and 300, it was mainly the white, white fragments, those um, that we had identified as PVC. So stenosone sediments also had distinct signature of the PVC, also P and PP, to at least to some extent can be related to the local spills. So I think that needs to be worked on um, more uh, systematically by the authority and the industry uh, to look at the things. Then we had a case study in uh, Uddevalla city in Antrim, the fjord, um, with the aim of trying to identify main sources of microplastic from a normal Swedish city to the, to the um, marine environment. And Uddevalla is sort of kind of uh, had, had the uh, filter of islands outside, so it's not a massive uh, influx of, of uh, uh, long range transport. So um, we did both water and sediment samples, so taking samples in the gradient here for, for trawling, manta trawling, and took a sediment sample in the fjord. So the, the manta trawling had a, a one station, uh, well, all stations were close to the city, it was higher, but the, this just uh, in the mouth of the, of the creek here was much, much more higher than the others. So this station um, four, was dominated by uh, LDPE fragments, which were puzzling us a bit. Uh, it, it is close to the wastewater treatment plant outlet, but if, if that could be the case, we don't know. Um, the other common um, um, compositions are, are exp expanded polystyrene. If we then instead go to the sediments, the, the, the particles look quite different and made of different polymers. Uh, we do see the light polymers like polyethylene, but also more heavier uh, like PV, PMMA and PC um, solid polystyrenes. Much more black particles, um, some uh, uh, soot, um, but also these black elastomers that we had not, never found in surface waters or, or on the beaches. Um, so the, the distribution of, of the particles looks like this. We have the larger fraction, the 300 microns, and the smaller fraction, 100 to 300. So for round fibers, we have, first of all, some contamination uh, issues. So fibers is very difficult to work with, um, because they are all over, all around us in the lab. Um, there are slightly higher concentrations around the, the innermost stations than further out, but um, fibers seem to spread out in the system. Identified polymeric particles uh, are, again, um, not so um, clear um, on, on the larger fraction because there are very few particles, but in the smaller fractions it is a um, distinct difference um, in the stations to the outer, but again, it is, um, um, the, the variability is quite large. Paint particles um, was um, highest in the, uh, in the stations related to the shipping harbors, or the commer commercial harbors, um, and uh, decreasing further out in the gradient. And then we have the, the black elastomer particles, which is not that many on the... Um, Larger fractions, you see there, um, but they are very close to where we have uh, traffic uh, and, and uh, the, the roads uh, surrounding here. For the smaller, for smaller size fraction, that's where we find most of the black elastomer particles. And as you see, it is quite a rapid decaying uh, trend towards the, the outer stations, but it, it was very, very high abundance. So if we compare um, the two size fractions, uh, what are the most dominant uh, forms? We see that uh, fibers and the black elastomers are the, the two most dominant uh, compositions. And so how much is much? Um, I will, that was something that uh, Christian will address, I think. But just to, to see our studies and, the, and the, also the study in the Roskilde Fjord, um, in, the, in our parts of the world, say roughly around 10,000 uh, particles per 
kilogram dry weight. And, and that is, compared to the few studies that is available, it's quite, um, quite high, I would say. And, um, but there is big issues also with comparability, the protocols, the size ranges, um, so still it's hard to make um, very good comparisons on a, on a larger, larger scale. Um, I think I had a few slides on also on uh, marine sources, but I think we'll skip forward to that so we have more time for, for questions. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention.